Good evening, everyone. I'm Associate Professor Naomi Frangos, and it is an absolute pleasure to welcome all of you tonight, tonight's lecture. I would like to begin by thanking our Dean, Maria Perbellini, for her incredible generosity and enthusiasm in supporting our lectures, to Jennifer Mitchell for helping organize these events, and all of our colleagues, faculty, alumni, staff, and students who've come here tonight to hear our distinguished guests, Dan Allen, architect, and George Dunton, 27, professor of architecture at Princeton University School of Architecture, share with us his body of work recently published in his new book, Four Projects. It may be fair to say that architects are drawn to the study of, or practice of architecture for the love of drawing and building. Through drawing, we think we understand the buildings we're designing. From writing about them, we think we understand why they came to be. Somewhere between drawing and building lays the critical translation of our engagement with the work. So if our drawings could speak, what would they, what would they say? Stan Allen's body of work is an exemplary showing of how these modes overlap and reinforce one another. I first came across Stan Allen's work over 20 years ago at the Canadian Centre of Architecture bookstore in a little catalog of his work at, from, published from Columbia Graduate School Gallery where Stan was professor there at the time. It was entitled Building Between Drawing and Building. It featured a series of proposed fictions, sight line trajectories, installations, details and built forms concerned with constructed works for inhabiting the field of exhibition spaces. Uh, as a third year architecture student, you can imagine, our Ellen's work impressed and represented something exceptionally relevant to understanding the way we think through creation. That architectural practice unfolds not as a one-way translation from drawing to built form, but as productive thinking where the life of the work lives on beyond its physical material construction. To, to be reconsidered, and generative of new thought after its making. Today, we invited Stan Allen to rethink the architectural exhibition with his current installation in our old Westbury campus gallery, which opened last night, um, and you'll all get a glimpse of during the lecture this evening. Over the last few decades, architect, writer, and educator Stan Allen has made a significant contribution and impact to the field of architecture through a seamless weaving of the, his critical thought manifest in practice teaching, essays, books, and lectures. Working across scales from landscape urbanism to buildings and installations, his work reflects on and responds to the complexity of the modern city through an extensive catalog of innovative design strategies, looking in particular at field theory, landscape architecture, and ecology as models to revitalize the practice of architecture. With degrees from Brown University, Cooper Union, and Princeton, he also worked for Richard Meyer in New York and Rafael Maneo in Spain before establishing his own practice in 1990. His firm, Stan Allen Architect, has realized buildings and urban projects in the United States, Latin America, and Asia. Alongside his practice, Allen's outstanding academic career has impacted architectural education through his integral research and projects. Previously, at Harvard and Columbia, um, teaching there. Stan Allen currently holds the title of George Dunton, 27 Professor of Architecture at Princeton University's School of Architecture, where he served as dean for over a decade since 2002, and is also now director of Princeton Center for Architecture, Urban, and Infrastructure. Since 2008, he has received three PA awards, five AIA awards, the John Haydeck Award from Cooper Union, an Academy Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. In 2012, Allen was elevated to the AIA College of Fellows and Design. Sorry, and in 2012, he was included into the National Academy of Design. In 2016, he was one of 12 architects representing the United States at the in the architectural imagination, the American Pavilion at the Venice Biennale last year. In addition to numerous articles and project reviews, his architectural work is published, as you all probably have encountered in your courses. Um, points and lines, diagrams and projects for the city, and his essays and practice, architecture technique and representation. And more recently, his book entitled, uh, edited the volume, Landform Building, Architecture's New Terrain, published by Lars Mueller in 2011. Tonight you will hear all about his new book, Four Projects, published by Ohio State University and ORO Publishers. So kindly, please take a moment to turn off your mobile devices and please welcome our inspirational guest, Stan Allen. Thank you. Thanks. 
Okay, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I, I want to reiterate uh, the thanks, well, first of all, to Naomi for, for the invitation, and uh, to uh, the dean, to Maria, for um, the opportunity not only to lecture, but also to um, produce this uh, exhibition and installation out in, uh, out in Old, Old Westbury, and also to the students who helped out uh, uh, realizing uh, that project. Um, what, what I'm going to show tonight under this title, Body of Work, is rather than making a kind of snapshot of recent work, I want to reflect on a kind of larger trajectory uh, of my career uh, and situate some of that recent work in terms of that longer career trajectory. It's also a way for me of sort of making sense with what may appear at first glance to be work that seems very, very different. Um, uh, the image that I'm showing here um, is the first realized project. It's interesting that Naomi mentioned this book of uh, drawings and the exhibition in Columbia. It's, I think, I'm afraid it's more than 20 years ago. Um, but um, this was uh, the, uh, at that time, the Lalton Gallery, later Amy Lipton on uh, Prince Street, a uh, space that no longer exists. One of the liabilities of working in the art world is that things come and go. Um, but this, at first glance, would seem very, very different than the kind of work that I'm doing now. Uh, but in fact, we are doing another gallery in Manhattan now. And I would argue that despite the difference in scale between this project, for example, and some of the uh, landscape and urbanism projects you might be seeing, there is a deep similarity to the degree that the gallery is never really complete until it's occupied by the artworks, until curators or critics or artists come in and install works in the space. So that the space is a kind of platform or framework for what happens later. And I think this is true about architecture at every scale that it goes out into the world, becomes part of the collective imagination, and not simply the product of a single uh, architect or author. And clearly, in this case, with, whoops, um, well, kind of jumping the gun here. Um, they told me, yeah, this is the one. Uh, with artworks by Carl Andre and Saul Lewitt and Donald Judd, there's a kind of sympathy between uh, the space of the gallery and the works that are displayed, but that wasn't always the case. And I always would, in, in, in when I was doing more work with galleries, I always welcomed the artists who would sort of push back and, and, and kind of uh, attack the space. So the lecture is divided into three parts. They're not three equal parts in a way. It's really a kind of introduction, the main body of the lecture, and a kind of, uh, a kind of coda. And uh, part one really, want, really, um, deals with my involvement with larger scale projects that work at the urban scale um, and uh, my involvement with um, uh, the beginnings of what came to be called landscape urbanism, work that really came out of this book published in 1999 called Points and Lines, th had three chapters, Contextual Tactics, Infrastructural Urbanism, and uh, Field Conditions. And some of the thinking in that book led to contact with uh, Jim Corner and the early discussions around uh, landscape urbanism, thinking about how we could learn from landscape and ecology as a new way of thinking about cities and large-scale urban uh, projects. Um, landscape urbanism, in some sense, was a response to the way in which landscape had been sort of marginalized in the 1980s and 1990s, uh, so that uh, if, if we can think about Central Park as forming an absolutely integral part of the structure of Manhattan. Uh, it, 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 it conditions the form and the experience of the city. Uh, landscape had been kind of marginalized as sort of decoration in front of rather banal office buildings. And as many of you will know, uh, you know, not to beat up on poor Martha Schwartz, but um, this is the uh, project that took the place of Richard Serra's Tilted Arc. So uh, what had been seen to be a kind of confrontational piece of art is replaced by sort of happy, curvy benches and nice green plants. And of course, you know, it, it always astonished me that people who worked in this office building would sign a petition against the tilted arc, but they never thought to sign a petition against having to work in this incredibly banal uh, office building. So landscape urbanism was in many senses 
an attempt to reposition landscape as something that could have a, 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 a serious impact on the form and the scale of the city. And if I can isolate what I think are the four important working variables of landscape uh, urbanism, they're this ambition to work at a large territorial scale, uh, to work with questions of surface and pattern, uh, to deal with program and event in a, in a way that, that architecture hadn't uh, worked with, and probably most importantly, to learn from ecology and the idea of, of, uh, that, that cities and landscapes are always changing over time, and that you don't design for a kind of single finished master plan state, but rather you project alternate scenarios uh, into the future. So I'm going to show four projects in this uh, uh, category, really not going to go into any great detail, but really identify for each of these projects, one really key variable that was a kind of strategic variable that helped us work uh, through the problems that we were um, uh, assigned in these di different, different uh, categories. So this was a commissioned project in Taipei in Taiwan. Um, and we were asked to look at this uh, zone uh, adjacent to the riverfront and reconnect the city to the waterfront. Now the problem was this. Um, that the engineers had uh, created a flood barrier with, with good intentions. They wanted to protect the city from periodic flooding, um, but they had created this six meter barrier between the city and the riverfront. Uh, and the question was, how could we possibly work with, because the, the uh, protection was still necessary, but how could we connect the city to the river? So our solution was this, that, uh, sorry, 8.6 meters is the flood line, that if we, instead of going from a single wall as a kind of impervious barrier, if we could use a kind of landform, we could achieve the same uh, level of flood protection, but we could allow for the smooth connection between the city and the waterfront. So really it was a kind of single strategic move that's diagrammed here, that then all of the further decisions in the project sort of uh, unfolded from there. The other thing that we wanted to do was take the linear um, uh, organization of the wall and, um, oops, I keep getting, uh, this, is, this is like an idiot proof device that I'm man managing to mess up with. Um, we also wanted to take the wall and increase its length, to fold it back on itself. So there were certain areas where we could push the, uh, the green areas out more towards the edge, and certain areas where we could put, push the water back uh, towards the city. So this is an aerial view of, of the proposal. Um, but I think one of the things that's important to say here is this exact profile could change depending on the strategic um, requirements of the project as it, as it moved forward. Of course, the other important thing is that everything outboard of the wall um, had to be either hard surfaces or native plants, and, but then inboard we could um, create a much more, um, a much softer and more uh, human-scaled landscape that, that could become a kind of amenity for the for the city. So here you see the wall itself and the way it sort of spiraled up into that building, which had additional uh, programs including that are that were related to uh, the waterfront and the nature of, of the park. So um, the second of these four projects at the scale of landscape um, was an invited competition in Korea. Um, Guangzhou is about um, uh, 40 minutes south of uh, Seoul. Um, and this was an interesting situation because we were, we were the only architect-led team in the competition. All the others were landscape uh, architects. Um, and we were asked to look at these two reservoirs and the landscape around them and create a um, landscape park that would be related to some fairly large-scale development that was going to be happening here. So the, the question that we asked, which is uh, you, can, you can see here, is how, how is the park actually going to be defined in this sort of loose ex-urban landscape uh, in uh, Korea? Uh, that if you think about Central Park, Central Park is defined uh, 
as a void within the built fabric. There, 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 there was no built fabric here to define the park, and the development that was proposed that you will see in some of the renderings was, was very banal and disorganized. So our feeling was, in order to have a kind of identifiable presence and to stand up to the banality of the development that was proposed around it, we had to have a different strategy. We almost, we almost wanted to invert the condition of Central Park and create a kind of structured landscape that could be identified as the park. So what we did, it was a bit of a kind of um, um, bold gesture, we simply drew a line from uh, uh, the, the entire length of the site, uh, over two kilometers, and proposed a kind of landform infrastructure. But a structure that would transform itself as it traced the different landscapes across the site. So you, you can see that this, this is not our design. This was the sort of given development proposed on site. And it was really our feeling that if you were going to give the park an identity uh, in this context, it had to have a strong, even a kind of strong architectural uh, presence. Uh, so this is, the, this is the line. And of course, that's not the only thing we do on site. Of course, we, we worked with landscape architects and developed a very extensive um, strategy for recovering some of the, the landscapes and, and um, creating a kind of field ecology there. But the primary gesture of the project is this uh, built piece that, that runs the entire length of the site and then gets developed, again, between landscape and uh, architecture. So you, you can see some of the activities on the top of that, um, a certain point where the land slopes down, and uh, we created a kind of bridge structure that was porous, um, then uh, where it intersected with some other systems. It had to perform some work on the landscape, filtering the water, uh, producing clean water, so the, the, uh, the, 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 the reservoirs, which are of course man-made reservoirs, um, not natural uh, uh, waterways, um, so the, the water is cleaned by this uh, intervention here, and then as we come to the northern end of the site, uh, it's much less active and it supports activities like bird watching and uh, and, and is really focused on uh, nature at, at that point. So, so this is, again, simply to acknowledge that we, we did, in fact, pay close attention, um, uh, working with Shane Cohen, the landscape architect, to the, the, um, the, the landscape side of the project. Uh, and we really would hope that there were certain points in which, in fact, the architecture would disappear into the, into the landscape. So, so now, if that was a very strong architectural intervention in a kind of exurban landscape, um, I think it's important to underline the fact that the principles of landscape and the kind of thinking that urbanism and architecture can learn for landscape can happen in a dense urban environment. So this was a very interesting proposal. Um, we were invited by the Architectural League and the City Planning Department of New York City. This was four or five years ago, done in collaboration with Rafi Siegel. Um, and uh, very rare for architects, we were asked to break the, break the codes. Uh, they, they invited six teams of architects to look at the New York City housing codes and the New York City building codes and look for those places in which the current building codes might be um, discouraging innovation and uh, responding to the realities of, um, of uh, contemporary housing in, uh, in New York City. So what Rafi and I decided to look at was the, the, there are many, many uh, office buildings from the 60s and 70s that are reaching the end of their useful life. Uh, and the structure in many cases uh, can be reused, uh, but the floor plates are too small, the mechanical systems are obsolete, and the, and the building skins are obsolete. So we said, what if we take all of the complexity that's normally contained within a, a horizontal Manhattan block and rotate it up into the vertical dimension like this, and then run a kind of landscaped pathway vertically up through the building, uh, take 
the skin of the building off and then use that landscaped pathway to erode the floor plates and create a kind of vertical experience of landscape uh, within the city that could diversify the programming of what is normally in an office building a kind of uh, monolithic uh, program. So these are the different programs from hotels to living to office to recreation. Um, these are the models where you see the, the uh, I mean, we don't expect anyone to follow that pathway because there are elevators and stair cores as well, but our, our sense was this would be uh, used more locally to create uh, new kind of social scenarios within the, within the building. So you, you have moments like this where the landscape uh, uh, carves out the building. Now, there's another thing that we did which is visible here in the lower part of the building. Um, you can get um, in two office floors, you can get three residential floors. Uh, so the, the, um, the housing that we were able to work into the, uh, to the uh, sort of carcass of this uh, um, office building, again, becomes a different, it, it, it works with a, a kind of thinner uh, exposure um, and um, creates duplexes and a, and, a, and a very different, much more sort of vibrant uh, landscape of uh, housing than you would, would typically find uh, in the city. So here you, you see that in relationship to the kind of existing texture of Third, Third Avenue. So the, the, the fourth of these, I'm running fairly quickly through these projects um, because it, it's, it's also really about setting up the projects that are um, that are, are shown in the, in the book that we're, we're looking at tonight, um, was the master plan for the uh, Taichung Gateway Park. Uh, this, was an, this was an invited competition that we won uh, a number of years ago. Um, the Taichung Municipal Airport had been decommissioned, um, 240 hectares, that's, that's over 600 acres of space, dead flat uh, in what had become a fairly dense area of, of the city. So this is a project about the strategic use of the void. Uh, how you can organize, again, on a site as large as this, no single architect is going to design the entire site. Cities are not made by one architect. Cities are made by many agents, many architects, many um, citizens. And uh, our proposal was to work initially with the roadway and sweeping out these curves of the roadway and creating uh, open spaces, which would then structure the development of the city as it grew up around the, the, the void over time. Uh, and again, thinking about the life of cities over time, we didn't know 10, 20 years out whether the city would, would, would embrace ecology, whether it would become more commercial, or whether uh, it could become a kind of platform uh, for, for culture. But the, the basic strategic framework of the plan could support any one of these uh, scenarios. Now, um, so we liked this scheme. Um, we presented it to the mayor. And he said, I asked you for a park, and you gave me a road. So we had to reroute the road and uh, make the park as more strictly a kind of uh, a kind of park condition. This is the final configuration of the, of the open space. Uh, and it's the open space that really just lets the city over time grow up into it. Now, the big exception to that are these buildings. Uh, uh, I mean, here, again, you just see some of the, I mean, it's a long, complex urban design operation where we sampled um, the, the typical um, uh, block structure from uh, Taichung, um, and there are a whole series of uh, urban design guidelines that I won't bore you with at this point. Um, but then the other major way that architects can structure the city is, is with large um, mixed-use interventions. And so uh, these sort of gateway buildings uh, that include hotels, offices, convention center, and sports arenas uh, structure the northern end of the of the park and uh, really create this kind of gateway um, from what will be the the route into the city uh, from the new new airport. Um, so uh, we we turned in that master plan in actually 
2008, so it's nearly 10 years ago. Um, and this is by way of setting up what will be really the, the kind of body of the lecture that uh, looks at the projects that are um, published in the new, in the new book. Uh, this is an aerial photograph of the current state of the site, so nearly 10 years after turning in the project. I mean, on the one hand, it's very satisfying to see the traces of our drawing actually in the fabric of the city. On the other hand, I mean, it's kind of a nightmare. I mean, you know, it's going to be another 10 years. It could be, could be 15 more years before our project is, is built out. Um, and in discussions with the mayor uh, after we turned in the project, we said, look, you know, wouldn't it be nice to have something built on the site in less than 20 years? And um, he um, agreed with us and found the budget for a small uh, temporary pavilion. And our initial sketches were uh, for a uh, freestanding pavilion that we could take advantage of the, all the space. and. Uh, working with these different points and views out to, to the site. But as very often happens, uh, the budget intervened. And in fact, in this case, I think that was a really good thing. Um, of course, it, it's a former airport. Um, there there were, were hangars on site. And um, it, one of these hangars was offered to us as the site for the pavilion. That solved a number of pro problems. Um, of course, the, the slab for the hangar is very, uh, you know, it's built to, to take the weight of the aircraft, so it's, so it's very heavy, so it can easily support the weight of this uh, pavilion. Uh, of course, we didn't have to worry about keeping the rain out. Um, and for us, this, this really presented a much more interesting opportunity than building a freestanding building on the site. We could react to the space of the hangar. And we could also, I think, more importantly, we could thematize the temporary nature of the pavilion, um, which led us to think about building the pavilion out of bamboo. Um, as you, you probably know, this is ubiquitous uh, uh, scaffolding material in Asia. It's a very well-known technology. Um, and in fact, there are people who um, are certified um, uh, bamboo scaffolding constructors. Although I'll tell you an interesting story. We, we developed a whole presentation, and we researched uh, bamboo scaffolding, and we, we presented it to our clients in, in uh, Taichung in Taiwan. And they turned to us, and they said, but in Taiwan, we're modern. We use steel scaffolding. So, so our cultural argument uh, didn't really uh, carry the day, but um, they accepted the argument that, it, that it, it, it had to do with the temporary nature of the pavilion. And, and in fact, um, all of the bamboo was recycled at the end of the project, which ended up being up for uh, almost two, two and a half years. So, so this is the project uh, constructed inside the hangar. Um, this was our concept uh, that we, we had a kind of dense bamboo forest. And we sort of carved out a void for the programs that occupy that space. As it turned out, um, we, we couldn't create public space with pure, purely bamboo structure. So there is, in fact, a steel structure. But then it's, it's wrapped with up to uh, three meters thick of uh, bamboo. This is the typical pattern with a 50 by 50 by 50 um, uh, uh, matrix tied together simply with, with metal wire. You can see that here. So it really has a kind of depth, a kind of tactile uh, quality. And then we created a kind of bamboo uh, skin. Um, so here you see with the school groups visiting uh, the pavilion. Um, I mean, these, you know, um, the working drawings, you know, I mean, things that we said, you know, that they were going to trim the ends flush. Well, in fact, it, it's much better the way that they resolved these uh, joints by letting them cross. Again, you know, the, the kind of reacting to the reality in the field. Uh, this is the ground floor plan, and you see the way it sits within the uh, pavilion. So there, you know, there you see those sort of details photographed by Iwan Bon. Uh, and Ewan is so good at sort of capturing the kind of way people interact with the, uh, with the architecture. And I think the tactility of the bamboo really supports that. Um, even in the detailing, um, we, we wanted to underscore this sense of lightness and the temporary 
uh, quality of the pavilion. So with the fabric and uh, the way that even things like openings and railings are made, the way it sort of dissolved uh, into the ceiling of the, uh, of the space. And again, this, the, the, the way that school children feel very comfortable uh, uh, next to it. Um, so this, this idea was very quickly adopted for an installation at the Guangzhou uh, uh, Biennial shortly after. Uh, and we wanted, you know, one of the things that bothers me about pavilions at biennials is they're never occupied. So um, we, asked, we asked them if they could, um, uh, that, that this, this is an aviary, and we wanted them to at least populate it with, with birds for the course of the, of the biennial. So. Um, so I think there are certain aspects uh, that you see in the kind of formal language here that are beginning to emerge out of the, um, um, the, the, inf uh, the info box in Taichung that really became very important to us in this, this particular project. This was a competition, again, a competition we didn't win uh, for the city of Maribor in uh, Slovenia. And for us, there was a kind of contradiction in the, in the competition brief that we were given here. Um, on the one hand, they wanted a contemporary arts center with a, with a very strong institutional identity, something that would uh, be a kind of um, uh, new institution in the city and, and would position them relative, they were the European, they were, uh, European cultural capital. Uh, the year that this was meant to open. At the same time, Marbor is a, is a, is a very, sorry, very beautiful, um, uh, well-preserved historic city with this, with this very particular uh, uh, roof, uh, sloping roof that, that, that gives it, it, it this, this, this identity. So, so how could we both fit into the texture of this historic city at the same time uh, give the building a kind of strong uh, identity. Well, part of it was programmatic, that there was, that by lifting the building up and connecting the public programs back to the city, and then the inward looking functions of the galleries that are more um, partitioned, more module, could, could sit up there. So in, in a curious way, I went back to some ideas that had been sort of spelled out in, the, in this famous piece of writing called um, uh, uh, from object to field um, from the middle uh, 1990s and thought about how you could aggregate a number of different uh, units to create some sense of the whole. Uh, Ed Eigen, who was a colleague at Princeton at the time, after seeing the project, uh, sent me this image, um, which is a, a diagram of speciation and different ideas about speciation. So you see, for example, here, this is the Linna Linnaean idea, where you simply draw boundaries within a continuous field. Um, and then here, you have islands that have no interaction with one another. So here, if the boundaries are, are arbitrary, here, if the islands have no interaction with one another, these two are the interesting ones where you can, you can read the identity of an individual cell, but you can imagine the kind of interconnection. So that, that became a kind of model for the way in which we could work with uh, the, the dilemma of both creating a kind of clear identity for this building as an institution at the same time relating it to the fabric of the city. So that the single unit is based on the typical, so a city like, a historic city like Maribor is made up of individual buildings that follow particular patterns. Um, so that the lot size, the typical lot size is what gave us the size of this individual unit. Then by aggregating the units, which are all of the same family, um, we, we create a new sense of the whole, yet we can make the kind of uh, reference to the roof structure without being mimetic, without, without imitating the context, we can make a kind of clear relationship to the texture of the historic city with uh, the, new, the new project. So, uh, so that's, that's the, the uh, model in the site. Um, each of these units has a pentagonal footprint. Um, there happen to be 15 of them in the uh, organization that we chose that is relatively unimportant. And one of the things you see in this diagram um, 
if we started off with hexagons, but with hexagons you, you, can, you can close pack hexagons and you don't have any uh, void spaces. The, the thing about the pentagon is that it doesn't pack very well. It doesn't aggregate cleanly. And that gave us these sort of voids which then became courtyards within the system. So you see, you see that here. So we could create a kind of porous mat um, that would bring light down into the center of the, of the site. Um, so I mentioned programmatically the structure is lifted up and then uh, obeying the geometry of the pentagon, we create a kind of lattice-like structure underneath uh, so that the, the, the uh, public programs can be continuous, yet the gallery space is partitioned that allows for curators and artists uh, to respond uh, to kind of room-like structures in the upper part of the uh, of the, of the building. So you, you see that here in our model. And you see the way, I, I like this drawing, uh, this model a lot, because you, you, you can identify the pentagonal form here, yet it forms a kind of continuous lattice in which the individual unit disappears into the texture of the whole. So this is the ground floor, and you see the way in which we create kind of pockets of space to pull people into the site. Um, not creating kind of structured plazas, but really creating uh, something that's more continuous with the historical texture of the city. Um, but then the gallery spaces are modulated. They, they provide the walls. They provide the vertical views up to the light that's coming in. Uh, this was intended for changing exhibitions. And then, uh, so that's visible there. You see the courtyards that bring the light into the center. And then upstairs, where you're really under the sort of undercroft of the uh, roofscape uh, for smaller scale works, drawings, and, and photographs. So, so that was a very important uh, project for us, even though we didn't win the competition. Um, and it also looked back to some residential projects from a couple of years before that had also been concerned with the kind of um, active profile of the building against the, against the sky, and even some references to sort of traditional chimneys and uh, pitched roofs that we wanted to work with in some of this uh, residential work. So um, shortly after the competition, we were asked by a, a client, we had built this house uh, right around 2000, we were asked by a client to add uh, a studio building to the house, and um, we said, well, we'll just build one of the Maribor pavilions. Um, and uh, so this was the original 1999-2000 uh, house. And not only did we create a kind of vertical counterpart to the horizontal house, we were able to rework the landscape and really better integrate the uh, original project into uh, its site. So it became, you know, it's a sort of wonderful opportunity for an architect to revisit an older project and develop it uh, in, in to, to the sort of sort of to the next uh, level here. So, so here you see the study model, uh, the existing house on the left, and the and the new studio pavilion, um, which also um, was by by working in a much more structured way. Also worked with Shane Cohen on this uh, project. The two different levels and extending the landscape uh, out from the house, we were able to really develop a much more coherent. Uh, uh, relationship between the, the house and, the, and its uh, landscape. Now, you know, I, I mean, I'm a little bit flippant about saying, well, we just decided to build one of the Maribor pavilions. In fact, the pentagonal form worked very well for, the, for this particular artist's uh, studio. She works with projection, and so the uh, curved wall, the fifth wall uh, that, that disrupts the, the closed form of the, of the cube, actually really did uh, create uh, a very useful space for the studio. And, and of course, the verticality brings light down from above, uh, while at the same time uh, preserving the walls that she uses uh, to project. So she gets this two very tall walls and the sloping uh, sides of that uh, figure um, create a, 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 a she has a, a very elaborate uh, network of, of lights that can be adjusted and changed uh, that, that, that work for her um, to, to, uh, to, to really use the, 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 the space. So um, 
these are some recent photographs. Uh, uh, the Scott Benedict photographer that um, has really been a pleasure to collaborate with and, and let him have, have him bring out these sort of new aspects of this project now that the landscape is kind of grown in and the different conditions of the light and so on. So uh, the projects in the book are at two different scales. There are two museum projects and there are two smaller scale uh, built projects. And it's really that interplay uh, between the larger scale and the smaller scale and what ties those uh, projects together that the book is, is, is about. So this is a very, very different context, obviously. Um, this is an invited competition um, for the city of Tainan in uh, Taiwan. Uh, the comp original competition, which was won by Shigeru Ban, uh, involved this site here and then an existing parking garage uh, that had been structured to um, anticipate a larger building on top and also the kind of connection between. Uh, obviously, most of our attention went uh, to this site. Uh, now, what was, if, if, again, for us, part of the problem of this site, very different from the Marabor site, was how to create in this kind of dense, very vibrant, uh, but also quite disorganized um, architectural fabric, how to create a kind of appropriate site and place for the, uh, for the museum. Um, and uh, one of the things, uh, Tainan is um, the most important center in Taiwan for Buddhist studies. And in fact, right between these two sites, right here, there's a very, very important um, uh, Buddhist study center. Uh, so you can see the, the sort of temple precinct and the temple itself here. So we, we thought we could really learn from that idea of the temple precinct and create a kind of larger, more institutional scale precinct here for the museum and that the rectilinear form that defined the, the precinct would be ideal for the galleries, uh, for the sequential uh, order of spaces of the galleries and the rectilinear uh, backdrop necessary there. And then all of the public spaces would, would take the form of these, these figural elements that would, would, would give uh, the site a kind of identity. So uh, the diagram of the project is very simple here. Um, these are the, the public spaces that relate directly to the city at, at, at grade. These are the gal sequence of galleries, two, two levels of galleries, skylit blocks that form a cycle circuit here, and then all of the collective programs in these strong figural elements uh, that really could, could function at the level of the city uh, to uh, telegraph the identity of this new institution in the city. So here you see this in a way creating a kind of uh, focused contemplative space for the museum within this, you can see, really quite kind of disorganized kind of urban fabric, and then these big figures that house the, the different public programs. Also Pentagon in, um, uh, in plan, uh, and then uh, developed. So uh, the, the series of projects that are shown in the book, many of them are variations with these different geometries and working with the figural character of this, uh, of, of this geometry. Um, it can be scripted, and this is uh, a script that was written by somebody in the office, um, but the rules are so simple, really, that they don't actually need a computer. So they are algorithmic to the, in the sense that they are based on a certain series of steps and rules, um, but they don't necessarily need the computing power that, that uh, is normally associated with scripting. So, so here you see the model. Uh, the gallery blocks, the, the, the texture of the skylit roofs, and the big forms that, that um, pick up the public programs of the site. Um, and then you see the way in which this creates a kind of street front, but the forms are visible from uh, the exterior, and then this is the condition of that uh, enclosed precinct. We pay a lot of attention to plans in our office. Um, and one of the texts in the book is about uh, the, what, for me, continues to be the importance of the plan drawing. Um, so here, 
just working up through the sequence of plans, the entry in public spaces, uh, the circuit of galleries, um, and uh, view of the galleries, the skylit spaces, the double height spaces, connection to the public spaces, um, and then uh, as you see the figures of the, um, uh, of the, of the public spaces, the, uh, this is education, auditorium, um, and then uh, moving further up, cafeteria and upper floors of the education, and the, the, the roof of the gallery. So uh, I mentioned that the, the two levels of parking had to stay, and that uh, column grid structured everything that happened above. So again, if you go back through the plans, uh, you, you can see that kind of uh, strong presence of that uh, original parking garage uh, geometry. So, so, um, so when I show, I mean, this is the image chosen for the cover of the book. And these are really a collection of projects from uh, the, the, the office that range from studies for a very small uh, library edition um, to the, the kind of large forms here. And, and this is a favorite image of ours. These were um, um, teaching blocks um, from uh, the late 19th, early 20th century in German, Germany um, that showed crystalline forms. And the, the way in which, in the study of crystals, um, the numbers of surfaces and the symmetries or asymmetries of those surfaces have kind of structural potential. And uh, we, we really feel we're working with a, with a very similar um, uh, idea here. And, and so when I talk about the move from the biological to the geological, it's, it's really meant to think about the, the, the implications of, of the kind of history uh, here, but also this kind of history. So um, a lot of my work, um, the, the, the studio building is in the Hudson River Valley, and uh, I now work part time up there as well. And um, relating to that history and the geology and the, the place there becomes uh, very important as well. So this is a, this is a very small project compared to the uh, museum, but um, I think you see that in fact the, the geometric operations for the large figures in the in the Tainan project are exactly the same as those in this uh, much smaller scale uh, work. Um, it is, again, a pentagon in plan. I can explain a little bit about that. Um, the conceit here is that the plan is a kind of, um, the plan references the sort of archetypal uh, house form, and um, which is, in fact, also a five-sided figure, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, this is the ground floor plan where, where the walls, so there's a kind of spiraling organization. You enter here, you move around here through the stair, and this wall sort of folds in. You can see that in uh, some of the photographs. Um, but of course, the, the, um, that sort of archetypal house form is also visible in the elevation as well. Um, and you see it here, but because it's not placed in its obvious relationship to the plan, uh, it, it, it creates a richer uh, geometry that interacts better uh, with the site. So here you see that idealized form in plan as the five-sided figure. This is the upper level sort of loft space. Um, this is that, that, uh, geom that, that spiral path. Um, and then this is the uh, upper level uh, workspace. Um, so view from below, and you see the ways in which um, an, another characteristic of the five-sided geometry, which is, I think, quite interesting, is that in a cube, you can, you can, you can only ever see two sides at once. Uh, with a five-sided figure, you can, you can actually see three sides at once. So there are moments when there's a kind of flattening that occurs like, uh, like this. So, um, so another aspect that we've been thinking about a lot and that, um, sorry, just uh, seeing how I'm doing on the time here. Um, and it was very much in our minds when we thought about the installation out in Old Westbury is the, the building technology behind these small scale projects. That is to say, uh, the balloon frame as a kind of archetypal American form of construction 
when the balloon frame was originally introduced in Chicago in the, in the 1830s, uh, the, the balloon frame was actually a term of derision originally. Um, uh, traditional builders who worked with the post and beam and ver uh, the, the highly skilled mortise and tenon joinery said, well, these, these things will just blow away in the wind. Um, but the, one of the things that the balloon frame did, it allowed relatively unskilled builders uh, to build quickly um, because uh, it was dependent on two technological innovations, uh, machine-made nails and uh, saw, uh, sawmills cutting dimensioned uh, lumber. And it's had a huge impact on American domestic architecture. Um, the, uh, Vincent Scully, for example, identifies the thin membrane-like quality uh, that he sees as typical to American domestic architecture as originating uh, with uh, balloon frame uh, construction. Um, so the image on the left is our proposal for the Chicago Biennial that will open in September, um, where we're uh, really kind of exploring um, the ideas of balloon frame construction and the sort of part to whole relationships. I mean, I think you can see here, uh, again, that's individual figures or five-sided figures. You see there's some relationship to the Maribor plan here. Um, so we'll be fabricating this model over the summer to install in the, in the, in the biennial. Um, but more immediately, when we came to think about doing this uh, project for the gallery in Old Westbury, um, we also wanted to think about the history of the balloon frame and its relationship to American uh, domestic architecture. Now, there were two other references that are, I think are important here. There's also, for me, always a kind of dilemma with architectural exhibitions. The one thing that actually never makes it into the, art, into the gallery is the architecture. Architects show drawings, they show mock-ups, there are different strategies, but in a way, the architecture is always going to be outside of the gallery. So, so the object that we built, somewhere between um, a very large architectural model uh, we were thinking about Fishley and Weiss's project here. This is an actually a one-fifth scale version of a kind of banal Swiss office building. Uh, there's also the famous example of this is Mises' one-to-one uh, uh, -one mock up in canvas of the Kroller Mueller Museum. So we thought about this history of playing with scale, playing with materials, creating something in the gallery that would be an object in and of itself, but would also reference uh, something beyond itself. So in some ways, it's, it's an overscaled model. Uh, in other ways, um, it's, um, it, it has qualities of a mock-up or a stage set uh, or uh, a construction in, in the gallery itself. So the, 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 it, it certainly references the continual production of models in our offices. Um, again, this is just to put in context, uh, this is a project of ours in Virginia that's just beginning construction, so our preoccupation with, the, again, the kind of archetypal house form and the way in which uh, architects like, like Venturi have responded to the, um, the, 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 the image of the house, the, the reference also to a kind of temple form, but also the realities of balloon frame uh, construction. Now, the specific history of this project is that we, about, um, actually almost 10 years ago, we had a client who uh, had a site in upstate New York and wanted to develop uh, four or five houses. So we thought about how could we, how could we make four or five different houses that belonged to the same family, related clearly to one another, but, um, but we're also different from, from one another. And we wanted to work with, again, some of the sort of recognizable geometries of, that were associated with the house. Um, and so we developed this idea of a kind of vocabulary of, of pieces that individually would be recognizable, but that could, could be combined into many, many different forms. We ended up with sort of six uh, uh, um, uh, uh, variants. And this one in particular always intrigued me. Um, and I thought there was something that happened in this particular one um, that really none of the others had, where uh, you can recognize the individual pieces, but they really disappeared into a new 
kind of geometric whole. So um, this was the model that was done at the time in, in um, 2007. Um, the project never went forward, but it really seemed like a, a, a great opportunity to actually finally realize this project from uh, 2007 as the structure that we would build in the gallery in Old, Old Westbury. So I just want to want to walk you through the geometry of this because, again, I think it's quite interesting that the transformations. And we begin with this, there's such a strong sort of emotional resonance to this sort of archetypal house form. I mean, you know, you can see it in anything from a child's drawing of a house to the Unabomber's shack. So, so that's, that's our starting piece. Uh, first move is to duplicate it. So suddenly it's, it's no longer singular, it's doubled. Um, and then we double the doubling. Uh, we have to stretch it out to superimpose it. Um, we take those two forms and we superimpose them and we start getting these different kinds of, kinds of geometries. But then finally we trim so it forms a kind of compact whole, and that's the form that, that we ultimately uh, built. So it, I'm, I'm very interested in simple rules that produce complex effects, and this, this you know, from, from my point of view, is a, is a good example of that. So this is our initial drawing positioning it in the gallery, and this is what's built out there in Old Westbury. Uh, so you see the way in which we're making a very conscious reference to um, the balloon frame construction. This is a uh, one to four version of the original project that was designed in 2007. Um, and uh, it, 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 as I mentioned, it has some of the characteristics of a stage set, the idea that the, that the structure is very kind of immediate and direct, um, but it's visible uh, only th through the kind of shadow effects with the transparency of the Lexan. Um, one of the interesting things is we, we, we had a one-to-one -one drawing uh, on the floor as it was assembled, um, and it went together in the matter of a couple of days. So all the complexity is on the inside um, and uh, the only visible uh, as a series of optical effects because of the transparency of this material. And the Lexan was chosen, again, very consciously to, um, on the one hand, the, 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 the raw wood that references the uh, balloon frame, the stud framing of the balloon frame, uh, but then the Lexan as a man-made material with degrees of transparency that makes it harder to pin down. Um, and it plays with surface and depth and, and the effects of the, of the light. So uh, I hope those of you who haven't seen that get a chance to go out and see that uh, in, in reality. So, so I began with larger scale work. The work that I've shown here that, that goes back and forth between the institutional scale and the smaller scale built work is, is really the focus of the book for projects. Um, but we really continue to work at the larger scale and in that sort of spirit of also situating some of the more recent work in, in terms of the larger arc, um, I want to actually go back to if the, the gallery I showed was my first built work, this was one of my first uh, published projects. You can, uh, you can tell how old it is. I hadn't coalesced into the kind of consistent identity as Stan Allen, so it was published in assembl assemblage as under Stanley Allen. And these were a series of studies. Um, uh, th this, this work has, again, actually recently been uh, exhibited at SciArc uh, in, a, in an exhibition organized by Jeff Kipnis. So these are drawings by uh, Ben Nicholson here and Michael Young here. Um, but a, 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 a kind of theoretical project looking at the notations of Piranesi's Campo Marzio um, as a kind of fertile ground for experimentation that, that ta beginning, you know, in, in part I was just struck by some of the weirdness of these notations and the idea that you could depart from an ostensibly classical uh, starting point. Um, obviously this was done in the 1980s, um, very much under the uh, influence of Manfredo Tafuri and his, his, his readings of the Campo Marzio as the rationality pushed to the point of irrationalism, that that that, that could be something that could be interesting and productive uh, as a kind of experimental project for an architect, a young architect in the 1980s. 
And some of the work was very rigorous mapping. It turns out that Piranesi was one of the engravers of the Noli plan. So you can, in fact, superimpose the Campo Marzio over the Noli plan, and things line up, and they tell you a lot about the kind of liberties that uh, Piranesi took, but also the, the, the areas in which he was actually very faithful to what was there in the kind of traces of the city underneath. So, so there was this mapping component that, that looked at, at the history of the city and the relationship of all these pieces. But, but part of it was, was really a speculative design project, beginning with Piranesi's notations and then interpreting them in a, in a kind of new way. Now, I show this project, that 30-year-old project here, um, as a way of contextualizing this project, which was, which was uh, an exhibition we were invited to participate in at the Maxi Museum in Rome uh, in 2015. Um, the Maxi had um, uh, acquired the archive from the original Roma Interrota exhibition of 1978. So again, as, a, as context, my Piranesi work that was done around 1985-86 was very much in the shadow of the, the fairly recent experience of, 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 of Roma Interrota, um, in which uh, nine architects were given the sheets of the Noli plan and invited to make kind of speculations. The, the sort of fiction of the, uh, the original Roma Interrota was that the uh, 200 years of history between Noli and the present had maybe never happened. And, how would you go back and, and rethink Rome uh, through the traces of the Noli plan? Well, the curators of, the, of this exhibition at the Maxi quite intelligently said, well, the problem of the city, the problem of the contemporary city, is no longer exclusively a problem of the historic center. It has to do uh, with urban spaces like this. This is the, uh, the, the, uh, the GRAU. Um, the ring road that, that, that encircles Rome, uh, that when we think about cities today, we're as often going to think about problems of infrastructure, of the periphery of the city, of the juxtaposition of nature and architecture as we are of the historic center of Rome. And of course, um, you can't talk about Rome and its peripheries without uh, thinking about uh, Pasolini, and the way in which he sort of depicted this kind of dystopian uh, urban space. Uh, so um, the curators, instead of working from the Noli plan and the center of Rome, they, create, they invited um, uh, 25 schools, and they created a 50-kilometer um, by 50-kilometer grid and assigned each school a 10 by 10 kilometer uh, circle. Now, by a uh, sort of accident, curatorial accident, we were actually assigned the center circle. Um, and uh, all of the schools then presented their maps on this uh, installation that you could walk over. Um, and we were, we were given the center circle, but said, don't, don't pay attention to the center. Think about the periphery of the center, which, in fact, in Rome, within ten, uh, five kilometers of the center, you, you get into quite actually low density, uh, really ex-urban uh, space. So this is our uh, sort of first pass at the project. And uh, again, thinking as in the case of Roma Interrota, I think for us, the condition of this as an, as an architectural exhibition was as important as a hypothetical urban project. So since we had the center circle, we wanted to inscribe that condition in the center. Uh, but as it turns out, this, which is really quite arbitrary, just the, the 10 kilometer uh, space we were given, uh, turns out to be exactly halfway between the ring road and the Aurelian wall. So the idea of creating a new green circuit, not a road, um, but a, a, a landscape uh, sequence, uh, actually did make a lot of sense. Um, so again, if that's the primary sort of figural identity of the project, uh, it's not the only functional one. There's an ecological scale that tries to make uh, new transversal connections and uh, an architectural scale that works with some of these very large uh, architectural uh, uh, conditions. So here is our uh, 
uh, line running through the landscape and intersecting with some of the old Roman roads, a kind of palette of different events and materials that could happen along. So it would be for cycling, for walking, it would have sports activities along it. Um, but as I said, it, it, it really had to work uh, not only as a kind of linear circuit, but it, it also had to work in terms of connecting things across uh, the center and creating new ecological pathways, including the Tiber River itself, that would work across that, uh, that, that system. We were also really fascinated by what is in many ways a failed project, um, some of these very large scale urban interventions outside of Rome that fell within our, um, uh, the boundary of our site, the Corviale housing uh, here, the Tintoretto housing. And we asked ourselves the question, could, could these very large, what Kenneth Frampton calls megaforms, be recuperated and um, brought back into the life of the city as a strategy for colonizing this uh, exurban uh, territory. And I have to say we were very much inspired by what is my favorite of the original Roma Interrota projects, uh, the James Sterling uh, entry, uh, where he actually collaged all of his projects to date into the, the square that he was uh, 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 given. Um, and we wanted to make a kind of similar collage of megaforms, both those which were found on site uh, and those which were uh, researched and borrowed um, from um, more contemporary projects and from a, from a wider uh, variety. So, so these are just a few moments that were developed where you can see some of the projects collaged in here. You can see the kind of linear elements making connections across the city. Uh, you can see the way in which the, the collage of megaforms intersects uh, with uh, the loop system. And then that was further developed through a series of collages that, that again, tried to refer back to that uh, cinematic history and really think about the kind of scenarios uh, of inhabitation around the periphery uh, in this uh, hypothetical project uh, that, again, would sort of situate itself simultaneously in the space of an imaginative urban project, but also um, in the space of the gallery for the, the, the exhibition. So the last project I'm going to show is um, our uh, recent project for uh, the Venice Biennale, the uh, architectural imagination, in which 12 architects were invited to do hypothetical projects for uh, Detroit. And this really does return to some of those themes of the megaform and, and uh, field conditions. Um, Detroit presents a real challenge for architects and, and urbanists. Uh, all of the vitality that's visible in these early photographs from uh, shortly after the turn of the century. It's interesting here, you see streetcars, you see horse carts, as and only a few automobiles. It's now given over entirely to the automobile. And again, the, the, the interior of the city has been kind of excavated, and this is all happening in the kind of um, sort of airless precincts of, the, uh, of the, the suburbs. And you see the way in which Detroit has been emptied out. And of course, very informally, a kind of green landscape has uh, returned. So we were assigned the uh, Packard plant, uh, um, uh, Albert Kahn building that was originally uh, uh, started in 1917. Kind of extraordinary piece of architecture, of course, now in total state of ruin. Um, and we really wanted to understand it in the, its sort of larger position uh, within Detroit. Um, and the pattern that emerged was what has been identified by other people as a, kind of, as a kind of archipelago urbanism, where there still remain pockets of density in Detroit despite the emptying out. It's probably naive to think that Detroit would ever come back as a kind of dense, continuous urbanism. But could a big structure like the Packard plant become the catalyst for this kind of archipelago uh, urbanism? So it's not about context and local connections. Nobody's going to walk or bike to the Packard plant. But how could uh, 
a structure like this capture people both from downtown Detroit and within the city limits, but also from taking advantage of the infrastructural systems from the kind of larger uh, region. Uh, there's a little known fact about Detroit, uh, despite the economic hardship of the city of Detroit. In fact, the Detroit metropolitan region is the fifth most prosperous in the country. So there's a lot of money out there that could be captured um, through this archipelago strategy. So we became very interested in this notion of a kind of, again, the mega form, the city within a city. Um, how could we develop this as a kind of dense urban island? Um, and the strategy that we proposed is to treat it as a kind of infrastructural platform. Again, it's, it's too big to be designed by one architect. It has to be thought of as something uh, that's developed over time with many, many different hands involved uh, over that period. So, um, so the first move is to think about the infrastructure, uh, think about uh, how we can take the section of the daylight factory the kind of finger uh, uh, pattern that you, that you see here uh, in the original plan, and uh, counterintuitively, there are 20 million square feet here, we increased it to 30 million. Um, so we create a series of platforms and a deep section that can allow for fle more flexible programs than the kind of finger strategy. So we go from this configuration to this, and the, the creation of a series of of trays or platforms that can get occupied over time by different programs. So, so we, we convert from the fingers to a kind of mat building that then creates this variety of surfaces that are uh, serviced by uh, different circulation systems that could become a kind of very active platform uh, for, for new development over time. So the kind of key, this, this photograph is a kind of key for reading uh, the, the drawings and the models. This is the sort of serial production uh, arrayed in front of the factory building. We saw our, our model strategy, the serial production, but now differentiated, unlike the cars that are, that, are, that are all the same and repetitive, this uh, vocabulary of elements, all of these are the elements that are combined um, on those platforms over time through these different mechanisms uh, to create the kind of field-like reoccupation of these uh, infrastructural platforms. So the, the process in the office, in a sense, really, really um, uh, kind of simulated that. We, we didn't know what the plan was going to look like. All the different people just simply uh, uh, arraying these pieces um, um, uh, were, were essentially designing the project through the process of building the model. So the drawing, in fact, was done after the model. Um, now, but that kind of self-organizing strategy for us wasn't really sufficient in and of itself. There needed to be some sort of anchor program that would uh, catalyze this, this development over time. And the, the program that we hit on uh, was the, the idea of a botanical garden. Um, that um, uh, this was a way of thematizing the informal greening of the city, but, but formalizing it uh, a little bit more. There's a great history. The Botanical Garden, it's a scientific institution, it's a place of leisure, um, and it's also a place of, of education, and it also uh, functions to uh, preserve and protect uh, uh, na native species. So, so the Botanical Garden, uh, we, we found, thought was a very interesting institution that could, could kind of anchor this uh, new development. And, um, of course, there are very interesting architectural potentials here. Uh, Cedric Price's aviary here and Fuller's Climatron in Missouri. So, so all of the green areas are those which are devoted to the botanical garden, but you see, in way, you see the way in which all these other programs would be woven into uh, the, the institution. So it would be not a, not a singular kind of closed institution, but a kind of open institution. Um, so these are, these are experimental greenhouses. Uh, these are uh, aviaries and uh, uh, structured gardens. Uh, 
Um, here you see uh, the other aviary, but then more formal gardens. The section through this, where you see the relationship between uh, the, the old factory and the new and the new new program. So, um, so you know these obviously are very consciously designed, uh, but I think it's very important to, in a sense, read the project as only one of many possible uh, versions uh, of this uh, city within a city. Uh, go, going forward, where um, hopefully it, it could acquire over time some of the real uh, density and complexity that uh, that we associate with with cities and their uh, their social and political impact on the world. So, thank you very much. Sure. Fantastic lecture. Um, I just open up with a few questions before we give it over to the students and the audience. Um, so uh, thank you for, for, for coming to view the exhibition. Um, and uh, in, in reading your, looking over your, your new uh, book, um, I was comparing it to your Line. And um, 95. 95. Yes. Sorry. Yes. I was like, wow, that's. I, I, uh, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so the you've re, you've you've revisited field conditions in this new book that you're referring to, part one and part two, um, showing a body of work, and it's absolutely uh, impressive to see the uh, theoretical considerations. Um, not that you weren't practicing in 1995, but obviously there's so much collection of work that you've that you've developed since then, and um, it's 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 astounding to see how some of these concepts of the way that we that you have um, clearly identified um, in terms of uh, of a way of working and thinking and formalizing, et cetera, and, and actually put it into, into practice. Um, so uh, one question is that comes to mind is uh, you've, you've gone over, uh, you've, you were able to employ this over a variety of scales. And, and, and scale doesn't seem to be an issue. So when you go from the mega form or from the from landscape or urbanism or from the stuff that you've developed with James Corner and you show us all these uh, um, very uh, small scale individual house, um, the, the the field condition uh, still exists and. Um, Yet it oscillates a little bit uh, between the aggregation of parts to whole and what sort of sets up that field condition. So I thought maybe you could uh, talk a little bit about how and when does the uh, field sort of dictate or does the component start to mm -hmm. take over? Yeah, I mean, there, there's sort of two things there. I mean, one is that, that uh, you know, I would never force this idea on a project that didn't work. and. Um, you know, there was this very interesting moment when we were when we were working on the Maribor project that um, um, I mean, we really were looking at the program, we were looking at the site, and we were working with this language of aggregating individual elements um, and playing. You know, was it going to be hexagons? Was it going to be pentagons? Um, and it, 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 you know, at a certain point, I said, "Well, wait a second. This this is sort of like the field conditions ideas. I mean, it's dealing with part to whole problems." I, I showed a little sketch with a phrase from uh, my friends uh, Emilio Tognon and Luis Mencia, where they 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 had this phrase: um, a uh, non-hierarchical system that is capable of becoming specific at any any given point. Um, and that, you know, again, seemed like, well, that's enough. That's a kind of restatement of the field conditions idea. That this idea, because a grid is a a grid is a non-centralized, non-hierarchical system, but a grid is 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 equivalent at any given point. A, a grid is not capable of becoming specific at any given point. Um, and for me, it's that dilemma of having some sort of larger unity 
and at the same time having local identity, which I think it also, I mean, it can be described as a political problem as well, right? Uh, you know, the sort of do you, do you, you know, do you insist on individual rights or, 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 or participation in, in, in the collective? So, so that way in which that returned, but it returned accidentally. I mean, it, it really was complete unco unconscious, and then we, you know, then, you know, went, went back and sort of theorized it a little bit more, um, more specifically. But it, I think what's important is that it, 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 it does come out of the circumstances of the project. It was also, I mean, maybe I'm just a slow learner, but um, when the original field conditions piece was written in the 90s, uh, you know, and we tried to work with, you know, there were, there were certain projects where we worked with that idea, but it never quite came off, because I think we were very much stuck in the kind of mat building um, um, uh, analogy. And so, at the same time, in the Marabor project, as we're, we're looking back to some work from, you know, at that time, 15 years before, um, it also brings something new. It brings that, that attention to the sort of iconic form and, the, and the, the, um, the capacity of that sloped roof to reference the, the sloping roofs of the, of the traditional form. So, so as much as Marabor is a, a kind of link back to the field conditions idea, I think in many ways the sort of figural quality of the roofscape became more important to us go, going forward. And so the... the the part to whole relationships are still there, but the, but the strong connection to, let's say, some of the theoretical ideas of the field conditions are, are, are maybe becoming, becoming less important in the smaller scale work, but then they come back in the large scale work. Because again, I think the, the, um, uh, the, the, the field conditions idea is, I think, fundamentally an urban proposition. And there's, a, there's really a limit with some of these smaller scale projects to how, how useful it's go, ever going to be, precisely, sim simply because of scale issues. Yet, the f it, that's interesting. The, the field condition also um, sets up your, uh, your writings about diagrams and how diagrams right. matter. And it just, right. it, it makes so much sense. And um, the, the the interesting part about the diagram when you relate it back to the scales is that in the Marabor um, project, there is this uh, incredible intrinsic relationship logic to the geometries, yet mm -hmm. it reaches back and, and weaves itself into the texture, mm -hmm. of the history, historical texture right. of the city. Right. And in a way, the, 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 the Biennale project that, that you did in Detroit um, also taps into, at a larger scale, referencing maybe not necessarily the immediate history, but referencing this sort of chaos or the condition that it's needing right now. Sure. And yet it still functions on some kind of intrinsic relationship diagrammatic level. Yeah. No, that's true. I mean, I mean, again, I, I, I went through that last project fairly quickly because I didn't want to take up too much time from the discussion. But, um, um, you know, I mean, certainly in the, in, you know, going back to the original field conditions piece, the sort of extended horizontal field of the American city was a very important point of reference mm -hmm. that, um, uh, you know, if you think about Detroit, if you think about Chicago, you think about Los Angeles, you know, these are cities that, ex that are, that are field-like in their organization, and they're also open and porous to, to nature. And of course, Detroit has become much more porous to nature mm -hmm. o o over time. So. So that, that was, that in terms of the history, that was very much in my mind. Mm -hmm. But also the idea of the Packard plant as a place of production. Mm -hmm. so, so this idea of exchanging the serial production of the first machine age that is so important to Albert Kahn and Ford and the, the history of Detroit um, to this, this idea of a kind of differentiated field that um, would be constructed over, over time in, in the, in the in the uh, De Detroit project. Um, I mean, you know, one of the interesting things about the Packard plant is that, um, you know, Albert Kahn's brother was a, was a structural engineer and he invented something called the Kahn bar system. And one of the only reasons the Packard plant is still around is it's too expensive to demolish, so, mm -hmm. because it, it was built so, so solidly. So, so I think that's another aspect of the project was just the Elemental quality of that architecture in its ruined mm -hmm. condition right. um, as something to push back on, which, which 
connects up to this notion of infrastructure, right? That infrastructure is the kind of um, the the sort of elemental uh, platform on which other architectures or forms of inhabitation are constructed. Right. So it plugs back into the overall network of the city and its exactly, yeah. condition, right? Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I was yeah. there and I was so yeah. impressed by the... Yeah. I mean, I mean, the, the Packard thinking. plan is built like a yeah. highway in a way, right. you know, with, with columns and, and, and uh, slabs. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to my third question. Um, often when we think about these uh, field conditions and uh, you, in one of the chapters in your book, you, you talk about the importance of the plan and you brought that up. Mm -hmm. and. And um, we often think about plan as generator, and uh, and yet, um, that how do you negotiate uh, when you're working that way in terms of elevation, so that it eventually becomes figure ground or form making? Because mm -hmm. yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, given given that I I put so much emphasis on the on the plan. Um, for me, there's a couple of different things there. Um, I mean, one is um, I I think that you know it's a bit old-fashioned to talk about the, the the agency of the plan, and you know we think you know we today we work very much three-dimensionally, and we have a whole a new set of set of tools. And in fact, there are many people who say plans are irrelevant today, and you know a plan is just a you know it's just a cut through a computer model. Um, I would insist on the notational character of architectural drawings and our ability as architects to read three-dimensional space into a two-dimensional plan drawing. So I think that's actually a really important thing to insist on, um, that you know, just as a musician can look at a score and hear the music, as trained architects, we can look at plans and we can, we can see elevation, we can see sectional ideas, we can see structure, we can see the sort of rhythm of a sequence of, of spaces. Um, but then, you know, the flip side of that is this interest in the diagram, and, and you know, I would call those serial models, I would call those diagrams. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are models and, and they're three-dimensional, but, um, you know, the ability using digital tools today to move very, very quickly from two dimensions to three dimensions, to make quick study models, which, uh, you know, they're made by hand, but they're, you know, they're totally dependent on computer softwares and printing. Um, you know, that, I mean, that ability to toggle very quickly back and forth uh, between two and three dimensions, I think, you know, is, is, is really important to us. Yeah, and I think it shows really clearly if um, some of the uh, drawings that you showed and uh, some of them that are in the book, other ones that are in the book, um, when you start to tackle these uh, little geometries or mm -hmm. um, you often work with the unfolded elevation right and so it's never an elevation standing on its own and therefore the plan is somehow always present because the the, mm -hmm. the folding is there sure. and therefore the outline of the plan is in, is inherent in the right. elevation so is the the volumetric study right yeah I mean again it's it's partly I would say personal preference that that um, you you know you will notice we we tend to avoid curvilinear surfaces um, you know there you know many architects today are are you know that's very much part of their project it's 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 less i mean I think that for me is part of the the this this idea of the geological that works with facets and that they're they're geometrically for us more controllable and yeah as you said they're 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 developable surfaces you can you can unfold them and 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 work them work work with them in that that and i you know i think at a certain level i'm i'm just i'm a, i'm a, i'm kind of you know i'm attracted to the simplicity of that again it's this notion of of simple rules that generate uh, spatial complexity but um, so not not complexity for its own sake but uh, complexity that emerges out of the out of the, 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 the circumstances right and and I would say also you know again you know, in a large project like this we're we're you know we're we're in much more invested in in a certain complexity because you know again cities are intrinsically complex and you know you don't want to you don't want to force a false simplicity on something as complex and dynamic as as the city um, but you know, when we're dealing with smaller scale projects, that, that seems to be a kind of an appropriate uh, language to work with for us. Um, I'd like to open up the questions to the audience. If anyone has any questions for Stan. Yes. 
building phase of your career, transitioning from um, a few decades of exploration through your writings, through your sketches, through your diagrams, and model making. Now that you're coming face to face with your realizations, is that having any influence, to use your word, folding back on those original processes? Well, it's, it's, for me, it's less, um, I mean, uh, you know, it's always been my, my ambition to build. And, um, you know, I think, you know, even from those very early gallery projects that were, you know, very much about kind of, you know, negotiating the realities of building small scale projects in New York City. Um, for me, the, the bigger transition has been the move away from the large scale sort of landscape work. Um, and, um, you know, it's really motivated as much as anything else just, just by, a, you know, the kind of desire to actually see things that, you know, get realized in less than 25 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and also happen to be not a 19 hour plane ride away. So, um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think again, um, you see, when, when I use the word diagrammatic and, um, um, you know, that, that would tend, I, I think, in many people's mind to be sort of anti-building and anti-tectonic in a way, or anti-material, right? Diagrams and materials are somehow very, very different. But one of the qualities that I, that I for me, the positive quality of the diagrammatic is, the, is immediacy. Um, that, you know, something that, that you, you can understand in a very kind of quick and clear, clear way. So. Um, to that degree, you know, the, the, for me, the sort of diagrammatic and the engagement with building and the kind of immediacy of building uh, are, are actually kind of, kind of connected up, up to one another. Yeah? Maybe because I, uh, Stan, I was looking at Polly's work recently, um, who is, I guess, to what extent have you guys talked? I, in some ways, I <laughs> see certain things in your work and certain things in her work. Um, I hesitate to ask a personal question, but I right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but maybe for for those of you who, who don't know the the sorry, I'm I, I'm I'm married to an artist whose maybe most recognizable work is also very field like. Um, it very often consists of installations of many, many pieces that are, that are um, so yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of inevitable question um, and, um, you know, uh, certainly I think if, 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 if anything maybe goes back to some sort of shared interests mm -hmm. and, um, um, you know, and, and I certainly, I mean, I didn't talk about it so much here, but but you know, I've learned a lot from the art world, um, and you know, when I talk about immediacy, when I talk about diet, when you know, even even uh, for me, the, the 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 quality of the plan, um, the graphic qualities of the plan that have something to do even with some compositional questions of painting, um, and you know, long history of architecture's relationship to to to, to painting. Um, you know, these are these are very important issues. So, um, to me, uh, so uh, yeah. I mean, the answer is inevitably yes. Um, and um, you know, many of the examples uh, that I used in the original field conditions piece. I mean, I was, you know, I was very interested in the work of Barry Levay, for example. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, these are examples that are that 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 come from that you know that world of, you know, let's say sort of post-painterly practices that, that deal with space and installation and the re reactions to, to, to the architecture. So yeah, it's very much a dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. Hello, Professor um, Ellen. I have some question about uh, the objects you just uh, showed us. Uh, they're amazing. They uh, inspire me a lot. So my first question is, um, there is a project about uh, a huge bridge to go across a whole lake. It's called the uh, Gawa mm -hmm. yeah. Lakeside, and you you said that this is a gateway. So uh, I'm curious how you identify uh, 
this is a gateway because the distance is super long. Sure, uh, sure. So my second language, uh, sorry, second question is, um, so when the design going to the individual scale, uh, I saw you use a lot of uh, uh, like, uh, um, like uh, the, the geometry, is any like uh, hobbit or any reason you choose uh, if it's a rectangle or some other, uh, mm -hmm. like, yeah, like uh, specific reasons? Because I'm thinking um, maybe for a rectangle, uh, you uh, like it's quite limited to response to the sure. surroundings or like sure. when uh, several units come in, become a community, uh, yeah. it may create some. Uh, Gape space you can use for design, or why it not be could be circle or other geometry mm -hmm. like how you choose this? Yeah, well let me let me talk to the ge geometry question first because you you know again I think this is this is an area where architecture is really really very very rich that um, you know when you think about something like the triangular pediment or the or the pitched roof you know of course you can say it's just geometry right, but it you you can never escape I think both the cultural connotations, the relationship back to the pyramid, the idea of the primitive hut, you know, things that belong to the history of architecture as, as a discipline. But you also can't escape, you know, again, the kind of emotional resonances. Again, when a child draws a house, he or she will, will draw, at least in, in, in Western countries, will draw the, that kind of familiar your pitch roof. So, so uh, geometry for me is, is actually is a very rich, and we, as architects we work through geometry by necessity, but I think it's also finding geometries that, that like, like the triangular pediment, have this double condition, that they're, they're both, they both belong to pure geometry and they have some sort of disciplinary or, or uh, uh, sort of emotional uh, uh, resonance. Um, the case of the Pentagon in plan is probably fairly different, and again, I would argue, this goes back to your question a little bit, plan geometries are intrinsically more abstract than elevational geometries. You know, you, you, you sort of read elevational geometries in relationship to the upright figure and the horizon, uh, but plan geometries, you, ex you have to experience by moving through them, um, and they structure the building, right? Um, and so the Pentagon, you know, we've had this now sort of, you know, eight or ten year fascination with the Pentagon in, in plan. Um, and I, I think that the Pentagon, for me, um, is a very interesting figure, in part because of, of, of the, the point that I made with the Marabor project, that if you try and aggregate the Pentagons, it, you, 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 ne you necessarily get uh, um, you know, they break the pattern. They don't form a kind of perfect uh, um, uh, array like, like hexagons would. Um, but it's also, there's something for me, the, the Pentagon is interesting because it's the simplest geometric figure that is intrinsically unstable. So if a triangle or a, or a square are stable figures, you add that one side to the square to get the Pentagon, and without over-complexifying, you get a kind of interesting, unstable figure. Uh, I think it's something about uh, the uneven sides. I had this conversation with, with Michael Maltzen, the architect from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, he did a very beautiful house um, which has seven sides. And there's something about the odd number of sides that makes the figure inherently sort of un unstable in, a, in an interesting and, for me, kind of, kind of productive way. Question, yeah. Hi. Uh, my question goes to another subject, which is the Rome Project. Yes. Uh, because um, I'm interested in the diameter of the circle scribed, because having worked on Sector 8 with Colin yes. Road um, in the Rome Interrota, the, the scale of that was so proximate and so mm -hmm. manageable right. in terms of uh, affecting let's say things. Right. The one issue that concerned Colin particularly was the lack of any of us cooperating with each other yes. at the yeah. intersections of each section. So my question to you is, do you feel that the strategy presented to you of the circle mm -hmm. midway between the Aurelian Wall and the Ricardo Anolare 
was too broad to actually affect any territorial I, I like the circle, yeah, but I yeah. wonder, did you find it frustrating? Well, uh, I mean, not necessarily given the, the, the sort of, the larger context of the project. I mean, the 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer. You know, I think, I think the, the curators, you know, in a way were, were making a very polemical uh, uh, statement that, I mean, well, I mean, again, not, not to get into sort of too much sort of detail about the way that unfolded. There were originally 24 schools involved, and um, I had a conversation with, with people at Chara, the, the, the curator, and said, you know, we'd really love to be involved in this project. He said, you know, it would be kind of, pro said they, were, they originally left the center empty. And he said, it's gonna be kind of problematic, it's gonna get me in trouble, but you know, you guys can work on the center circle, a center, center uh, square. Um, and so I, uh, I mean, I, th I think the short answer is, you know, sure, in terms of a, what turned out to be a kind of four-month project done with students, it was just way too vast, yes. Um, and there were just so many issues that we really didn't get a chance to, uh, to work with. And, um, you know, frankly, I had similar concerns about this version of the project um, that you, you know, um, I know that at a certain, you know, there's a lot of back and forth with all the different schools um, and at one point they were, they were telling everyone at least all, to do all the drawings in black and white. And I, I don't think the, the, the way they present, so they were all one meter by one meter square and they were, they were installed on the, the gallery floor that way and, is, you know, and then the end of five meter by five meter square. And yeah, it, there, there was just way too much um, disparity between the different projects to make up any, any kind of coherent whole. So, so yeah, I think there was a kind of inherent um, contradiction in the, in the project. On the one hand, to say, yes, we have to look at cities today from a broad territorial perspective and you know, really think about the, 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 the uh, periphery. But then, because it's divided up and there was no communication between the squares, you, know, you ended up having a series of 10 by 10 squares that, that didn't have a lot of relationship to, to, to one another. Um, I mean, I think that for me it was, um, you know, this, a speculative project at that scale, um, you know, inevitably um, led to a certain degree of abstraction to the, to the drawings. So, um, you know, it was, it was really, that was really more the way we dealt with that issue. Um, um, that, that we knew we were never going to get down to a, a precise architecture. So just scale. a quick, easy question on that. Do you think you would have approached it differently if you had done it strictly as a professional office field office? Your wife's an artist yeah, and there's yeah, the field of the sure, sure, versus sure. with the student yeah. body? Would it no, I think that's, that's very important to say. And it's, I mean, even by the way, it's important to say about the Detroit project because you know, there's been a lot of discussion and, and critique of the Detroit project and I think a certain misunderstanding that, um, yeah, if any of these, yeah, I mean, I think that's in a way the, the difference between the first part of my lecture and the last part, that the last two are speculative urban projects and the first four were professional urban projects mm -hmm. and, you know, where we, you know, I mean, I mean we, you know, you work in big interdisciplinary teams with landscape architects and, and engineers and ecologists and, um, it's a very different. It's a very different way of approaching a project when, when you you know you have that sort of you know professional responsibility to see. See, I think in the in the professional projects. I mean, yeah. Thank you for pointing this out. Actually, um, you know, we we are thinking about strategy and and problems of implementation. Um, so, you know, the the point, for example, in the in the first Tainan, Taiwan project where, you know. Essentially, our job was almost done when we could give them that diagram of going from the wall to the landform. But, you know, it doesn't make such an interesting project. Yeah, not there. Uh, Stan, I've always ad really admired uh, deeply your ability to distill complex things and make them accessible. So I'm going to ask you a very broad question. <laughs> okay. Um, what do you think is today, in the context of your own work, what do you think is the most um, pressing debate in architecture, in architectural theory, and how would you situate your own 
mm -hmm. work in, in the context of that? Right. Well, I actually have an answer to that, which, <laughs> which is going to be equally broad. And you can agree or disagree, but um, I, I would say, I, I told you it was going to be broad, I would say the big intellectual issue driving, I think, both art and architecture in the 20th century was, was uh, the, the, our relationship to technology. So I think that goes from early modernism and all the debates and discussions about the machine, understanding simultaneity and cubism and futurism, you know, the, 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 this, you know, I mean, wrestling in so many different forms with the new technologies, first of the machine and then later in the 20th century with, with new, uh, new media technologies and digital technologies and the impact on, on our lives of media and so on. I mean, these, it seems to me, are the kind of driving issues intellectual issues of the, of the 20th century. I think, th for me, the big driving intellectual issue of the 21st century has to be our relationship to nature. Um, I mean, it's become evident through problems of the environmental crisis. It is obviously an outcome of, of te technology, right? Because we now have technologies to, you know, to uh, essentially, um, um, uh, you know, you know the, the, that, that many uh, geologists and philosophers refer to our, our current period as the Anthropocene, uh, that, 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 that mankind has changed the planet and the climate to the extent that we can now talk about it in terms of, an, of a new geological era. And, you know, all the different ways in which we have to come to terms with that, you know, whether it's the kind of day-to-day -day issues of you know, dealing with sustainability and more efficient buildings or uh, dealing with questions of landscape and climate and, and, and green cities. But also I would say, you know, just as with, just as with early modernism, um, there were technical things driving, um, uh, there were technical things driving um, the changes within the discipline. Uh, you know, think about, this, this is also a very long extended answer, but you, you, you think about the, a huge innovation of early modernism like the free plan, right? Now the free plan is the product of new technologies of steel and reinforced concrete that, that allowed the separation of structure from building and closure. But the free plan by itself would have been nothing if it were, if it were just a technical innovation. It was also an aesthetic innovation based on, on, on a relationship to cubist painting. So it was, it was, it was a, you know, it's a, it's a perfect illustration because it's a synthesis of technological innovation and aesthetic innovation. I think we need a similar synthesis with regard to the, the, all the problems of nature and climate. So, so it's not only the sort of technical research that's necessary in terms of green buildings and so on. I think we need, we need a new aesthetics uh, that is appropriate to the problems of nature and climate change in the 21st century. Good answer. <laughs> that um, might be a good place to end. I don't know, but <laughs> any last it's hard to go. Hard to yeah. Hard, hard, to, hard to go. You know, broader that. than that. But. Good question, Nutter. So, um, well, unless anyone has any other questions, we we one yeah, more. One question. more. One more here. We got to get here from the students. Yes. What are the, um, what would be the things to take into consideration when we try to revive a city or a smaller, if we think about a, a smaller scale to revive a building? I mean, um, I know you gave two examples that I, were, mm -hmm. I was really interested. First, the, um, the building, where you see all this greenery going on in the building, and then also the Detroit, city, mm -hmm. so I don't know if you want to extend it. Sure, I, I mean, I think what's common to, 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 to both of these is, is a kind of strategic thinking that foregrounds the agency of architects and architecture. So I think as architects, you know, we, 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 we work in a, in a discipline and a profession that, that deals with complex political and economic and, and social issues, and we have to be attentive to all of those issues, but we also have to, so we have to understand the potential of what we do as architects, but we also have to understand the limits of what we do as architects. So, you know, 
our project in Detroit is not going to solve Detroit's economic crisis, right? I mean, that's, you know, I mean, what Detroit needs is jobs and better schools, you know, and architecture, maybe we can help a little bit there, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna solve those, those big issues. So, so I think we have to be very, very clear what we can do as architects, right? And, you know, part of what we can do is, again, we can kind of create platforms. We can create structures that other people can come along and use and, and inhabit in their own, their own ways. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, and every architect, every student is gonna find his or her own uh, position within that, that, that equation. Um, but I think, you know, I think you have to be, and, and, and you have to be creative too, right? I mean, you have to find new possibilities to intervene as an architect in the, in, in, in the city. Um, but yeah, it's really, I think, just, just having a very clear sense of both the opportunities and potentials of architecture, but also understanding the limitations and knowing when, you know, to, to defer to the citizens and the people who are gonna live in the city and what you can do as an architect to let, you know, to allow them to live fuller, fuller lives. So. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you everyone.